Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I have the great pleasure to be discussing the amazing skeletal system of the body. The skeletal system is so incredible, it's so important, and it's so dynamic. In other words, it does so many things, and the skeleton that you have today is a little bit different than the skeleton that you have a little bit later in your life because there's constantly a dynamic change in the density of the bone. And as you know, from maybe your life experiences, bones can be fractured, they can be broken, and they can repair. And so right out of the gate, what I want to say about the, the bone is that sometimes people have a misconception about the bone and think that it that it's like dead or, or not active tissue, but it couldn't be further from the truth. The bones are totally interesting organs and they're capable of division and they're capable of growth that is during your adolescence and then they stop growing uh, when you reach adulthood and so let, we'll get into all of that and talk about some of the the varied functions of the skeletal system in this video and so one of the things that people are interested in, in the skeletal system is the anatomy and so people like to discuss and it's really important to know the names of the bones for the sake of discussion and also for the fact that a lot of our muscles which are associated with the skeleton, the skeletal muscle, are named in response to the bone that they're attached to and in addition to that a lot of our nerves are named based off of their proximity to the to the bone that they're associated with as well. Like for example there's a nerve that comes around here on the elbow called the ulna nerve and that's when you if you bang your elbow which is right here uh, this this bone right here in your forearm is made up of the ulna whoops <laughs> and that's what's causing sort of that um, sensation of numbing that occurs and so it's it's important to know the names so you know is this a, a video about anatomy are we going to go through every bone of the skull or every bone uh, of the carpals in your wrist or tarsals in your foot no but we can go over a few of them, if you don't mind. We have our hands right here is made up of phalanges, these little fingers. And then we have these metacarpals, which are right in here, our carpals. More pictures to come on this. Our forearm is made up of the radius, which is on our thumb side, right here. And the ulna, as I was referring to before. This arm bone is, is called the humerus, right here. And then we have the collarbone which is made up of a, of a bone called the clavicle. And then here is, sometimes it's called the breastbone or sternum. And then we have our rib cage. Uh, backbone is vertebra. And then we have our pelvis girdle right here. We have our femur, which is the longest bone of the body. Our kneecap, which is the patella. And then in our shin, we have our fibula and tibia. The tibia is a, is a stronger, thicker bone. And then again, in the ankle, we have tarsals, metatarsals, and then phalanges. And of course, the skull. We can break the skeleton up into what's known as the axial skeleton, which is made up of the skull and the rib cage and the, and the vertebrae and the uh, sacrum and coccyx bones. And then the appendicular or appendages are the arms and the, the pelvis and the legs. So what's interesting about bones is that we don't often think about them until something happens and then we, if we have a break or something like this, then we can take an x-ray. And what's fascinating is they show up quite nicely in the x-ray because they're, it's a really dense tissue. Bone is a type of connective tissue, but bone in itself is considered to be an organ because it's composed of more than just one tissue type. So in addition to bone, there's nervous tissue in the bone, there's blood in the bone, and of course there's adipose tissue in the bone. So all of those tissues constitutes the fact that bone is considered to be an organ. So these are your phalanges you can see here. Phalange one, two, and three. And then there's metacarpal right in here. That's kind of cool. So what I want to say is that the bones are very, very active. And so the cells are alive inside and certainly the blood that it's formed inside of the bone is certainly alive as well. One of the things that, uh, just superficially, that you may have noticed about the skeletal system uh, is that the bones have different shapes. And so if the bones have different shapes, their shape often is related to their functionality. 
And so you can have really flat shaped bones like in your back or your scapula. Your clavicle is rather a thin bone and your humerus is rather a thick bone. And sometimes there's projections at the ends of the bones as well. And we'll talk about those a little bit, a little bit later. And so some bones can be like little rocks. In other words, the carpals that make up our wrist bones. Some of them are kind of flat. So if we wanted to get into the detail of like just the hand and consider this, I mentioned that these bones in your fingers, you have three bones, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And then your thumb has only two phalanges. And so what we call all three of these bones, we call them all phalanges. But what's interesting is some anatomical terminology that's very useful. The bones or structures that are furthest away from the core of the body are referred to as distal. So this is the furthest bone away in the hand, and so it's considered to be the distal phalange. This is in the middle or medial phalange, and then proximal phalange is closest to the core of the body. And so we can identify it this way. And then these are known as meta, again in the middle, metacarpals. So we have one, two, three, four, five metacarpals, and then here's the carpal bones right here. Here's the radius and ulna. The radius is on the thumb side. If we wanted to get into the anatomy of this, we can get into the anatomy of each of these carpals have a name as well. If you're interested in that, you could simply uh, search that on the internet and, and uh, look for anatomy of carpal bones are pretty cool. So I alluded to it already, but a couple of functions of the skeletal system is one of protection. And so obviously our brain needs to be protected by the skull and there our teeth are connected to the, to the skull as well. And so the rib cage is protecting our precious lungs and our heart. The sternum is protecting our heart. But in addition to protection, muscle is attached to the skeleton. And so let me just sort of get a little bit silly here. We can have muscle attached over here and over here. And if you recall, the point of attachment to a bone, to a muscle, is called a tendon. And so when muscles contract, they can pull on the bone and we can actually get movement to occur. So what we have here is muscles attach for the function of movement. We have protection from outside trauma and support to hold ourselves up and blood cell production. What's fascinating is maybe you knew this already that inside the bone there's marrow and over here at the at the tips of the bones the epiphyse as, as it's called there's something called red marrow inside here and this is where blood cells are produced so blood I meant to say cells blood cells are made inside here and there's blood vessels that come out although you can't see them here so all of our blood cells, and that would be red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets are produced inside bones. That's kind of cool. And then one of the more critical functions of the skeletal system is that it's a storage of minerals. So think of the bone as like a bank. It's a bone bank. And like, what is it storing? Well, inside the tissue, there's a lot of protein, but it also stores mineral salts, things like, whoops, things like cal calcium, whoops, Sorry about that, just got scribble and close. Let's see if I can turn that back on. Sorry for that technical difficulty. We'll, here's a little work around, look at this. So what I wanted to say about that is that inside the, inside the bone, it's like a bone bank. And so we can store calcium salts and phosphorus salts inside here. And so like a bank, if your blood is low in calcium, this is where calcium can be withdrawn. Or if you're consuming a lot of calcium, calcium could be stored in the bone as well. And so this influences the density of the bone and the strength and rigidity of the bone as well. So this is rather critical. You know, just in general, our bones become stronger and stronger as we age. And then as we get a little older in life, they begin to weaken. And so there's like this dynamic replacement, generally leaning towards increase of bone density. And then there reaches a plateau and then a decrease in bone density. So it's kind of like, again, like a bank. Uh, when you're working in life, you're storing a lot of money in the bank. And then when you're retiring, you're sort of withdrawing money. And so 
during your youth, you're exercising and that physical activity or weight-bearing stress on the bone encourages the bone to store calcium. And your diet, high in calcium, makes the bones very, very strong. And then when you're older, the bone starts to uh, withdraw a little bit more of its, of its salt. So it's really important. I mentioned this before. In terms of anatomy, the, the central core of the skeletal system is called the axial skeleton. And that makes up the cranium or skull, the facial bones. There's a lot of separate bones that make up the skull in terms of anatomy again. There's the vertebral column. There's your, um, your rib cage as well. And this hyoid bone is this little bone that's sort of free in the neck that protects the, uh, the larynx. Uh, your, your vertebral column uh, is, is an interesting one. Uh, your backbone, sometimes it's, as it's referred. You can get into this. Maybe you've, you've heard of these terms before. But this the cervical bones right up here. And then you have these uh, this thoracic vertebrae, and then you have your lumbar ones, and then you have your sacrum and coccyx, which is like your tailbone right in here. And so what's fascinating, I happen to have a, a model of this as well, and you might be familiar with the fact that there's uh, fibrocartilage that uh, is referred to as an intervertebral disc. And this fibrocartilage protects as a shock absorber to the uh, to jumping up and down and running in, in our life. And then what's interesting is uh, what the, what, one of the functions of the, of the vertebrae is to protect the spinal cord that runs down from the base of the brain all the way down. And then there's peripheral nerves that come out at certain points that connect to uh, various organs and other nerves. It's pretty interesting. So there's your, your backbone, which is your backbone, again, is part of your axial skeleton right there, the vertebrae and the discs that make it up. I, I, I find that the, the sacrum and, and coccyx bones are really interesting. It's like um, <clears throat> maybe you're not familiar with the fact that we actually possess a tail, short as it may be, but we do, do possess tail bone. And so here again are cool images of the discs right in here, which are made up of cartilage in between the bone. And then your appendicular skeleton is basically all your appendages that that uh, are attached to the to the axial skeleton. Here's your clavicle and your humerus, and et cetera. So it's shown here in purple. Now, what I want to focus in, there's so much to talk about in the skeletal system. And so in order to be brief about it, I'm just going to talk about a typical bone and what it does. So I'm just going to pick a typical long bone and sort of discuss some of the anatomy and a little bit of the physiology of a typical long bone. So that the the length of the bone, the shaft of the bone, is called diaphysis. And then these bulgy regions at the end are called the epiphyseal area, the epiphysis. And so the proximal epiphysis is, for example, if this is your femur, the proximal means that it's closest to the core of the body. So this would be the part where it's attaching to your hip right up here. And then the distal epiphysis is where it's in contact with the knee down below here. This shiny white material, you might know this at the end of, of bones, is our articular cartilage. And this, and this cartilage is protective. And it, it is in between where bones come together. Where bones meet each other are called joints. And there's often ligaments that will connect bones to each other. But the articular cartilage, which is not a type of cartilage, it's often hyaline cartilage in this case, but articular meaning that it's at the point of where one bone connects to another. We'll get into this a little bit more in detail in a moment, but the, the sides of the bone are made up of strong, dense, compact bone, but in the inside of the bone, it's rather spongy inside. There's like a lattice of bone as opposed to compact. And then how about this? In the inner core of the bone, there, it's actually, there's a space in here known as the medullary cavity. And this cavity is, of, is not empty, but rather it's uh, made up of something called yellow marrow, which is dense with adipose tissue. So how about that? That's another function of bone is to store fat right in here. And then this spongy bone contains a lot of red marrow, which is where red blood cells are produced right in this area. This periosteum, peri means around, around the bone as a translation is this fibrous con uh, connective tissue, which is a covering of the bone 
and it's continuous with tendons and ligaments. So periosteum, that's kind of an interesting term. So again, just same thing, but maybe a different picture review. Here's your articular cartilage. Here's the epiphyseal, epiphysis uh, area, the spongy bone. Here's the, here's the cavity. Here's the yellow marrow here. Here's the diaphysis. Here's the epiphyse. Here's the articular cartilage here. So what I wanted to say is that uh, where bones expand, I often, you know, as a child, maybe even as an adult, you draw a bone like this, and you draw it down like this, and then draw it out like this. So these bulgy ends are the epiphyse, epiphysis, and then the shaft is the diaphysis. And so what I want to say a, a little bit more about is this cartilage. This cartilage, though it's called articular cartilage because it's where the bones come, come together as a point, we have it uh, here, for example, at the, in the proximal epiphysis of the femur as it articulates with the pelvic uh, bone. Here is the uh, distal end of the humerus right there. This is your, in your arm, and it's meeting up with the radius and ulna. So this is your elbow right in here. And then there's also cartilage in between each of these carpals in our wrist as well. And so it's protection. You might be familiar with cartilage again if you're if you've eaten ribs you know that ribs have a lot of cartilage that connect the rib cage to the sternum you might be familiar with the fact that uh, it's found on the end of bones uh, in, in chicken when you're eating that as well here's a cool micrograph light microscope photograph of the diaphysis of the bone and here you see on the sides are compact bone and here's the medullary cavity inside you can see the yellow marrow it looks like adipose tissue, and it is. Up here is the outer coating or periosteum. What's interesting is you might think, I, I'm not sure, the hollow bone, uh, does that make it weak? In fact, it makes it even stronger still. Like the physics of this is kind of interesting, that, the, that it is actually harder to break a bone that has just compact bone on the outside and it's hollow on the inside versus it being completely uh, dense with compact bone. So again, this is inside. If you're familiar with a, with um, or if you've owned a dog, you'll know that sometimes bones can be cu cut cross section, and you can get like this marrow inside. Or if you've cooked with this before, this inside fatty, yellow marrow is dogs love this inside. So this is the yellow marrow. Here's uh, the periosteum peeling off, and I mentioned that the periosteum is continuous with the tendon which is fibrous connective tissue, which is attached to skeletal muscle. So when the skeletal muscle contracts, it pulls on the tendon and therefore moves the bone, so you have movement. So ligaments connect bones to bone, tendon is muscle to bone, and periosteum is the outer cover. It's so another photograph of the periosteum, again, this fibrous connective tissue. This is a great shot of blood vessels entering into the bone. You've got to have blood vessels coming into the bone because if bone is, is, is producing blood, it's got to exit. And obviously the cells inside need a source of oxygen and calcium. If you're, this is sort of like your ATM. If you're putting calcium into the bank or if you're drawing calcium out, it's got to be via a blood vessel. So here's a close-up of the periosteum. Here's the compact bone right here. And you can see not only does the blood uh, come out of the bone, it actually penetrates the blood as well. So there's a network of blood vessels within compact bone. Another interesting component of the blood is the unusual shapes. Uh, you can see some of, the, some of the joints are rounded like this in a ball and socket joint. But there's interesting appendages or, or processes, if you will, on the bone. Little extensions, little oddities, little canals. And those are where blood vessels can run or nerves can run along those canals and these serve as points of attachment for for tendons to connect to these regions right here and each of these have a name but again this video isn't going to go into that but that's a kind of a cool thing to to name all the processes that make and the grooves that make uh, perfect attachments for muscles to bone this is a great shot showing how the compact bone is found around the outside of the bone and then on the inside is the spongy bone right in here. The cartilage would be on the outside of the bone here and this is the joint where two bones are coming together. And so compact bone 
is on the outside and spongy is on the inside. So the spongy helps to keep the bones a little bit lighter in weight. Uh, here's a great photograph as well showing the compact bone and the spongy bone right in here, cross section of a bone. Um, what's inside the spongy bone is marrow. In between the, the lattice of bone tissue, you can have red marrow towards the ends of the bones where blood is produced, or you can have the yellow marrow, which is in, mainly in the, in the shaft of the bone. And again, blood vessels penetrate into the bone, as you can see here. It's not only in the center of each of these uh, osteons, but there are also larger blood vessels that penetrate through the periosteum as well. So the, diaph the diaphysis is uh, hollow, uh, though it contains marrow inside, as I was mentioning before. Again, a similar picture, but here you have uh, the yellow marrow. Here you have lots of blood vessels. So if the bone's ever fractured, it's easy to repair because there's a lot of great blood supply. So that's, that's a characteristic of bone. There's a tremendous amount of blood supply to the bone. And so if you get into the tissue of it, one of the main tissues of bone, obviously, is bone tissue. It's a type of connective tissue. Here are some cells shown here in purple with little O's on them for osteocytes or bone cells, kind of a general term. There's more specific cells called osteoclasts that break down bone tissue and osteoblasts that actually add bone tissue because it's sort of dynamic that way in terms of density. Uh, but in, nevertheless, what you see is these bone cells and all this pink area is a characteristic of connective tissue, meaning there's a lot of extracellular matrix. What's in this matrix? Well, there's a lot of protein in bone. Truth be known, there's a lot of collagen fibers. But it's not just collagen, it's mineral salts. These mineral salts, like calcium salts and phosphorus, maintain rigidity, and this is where we store our mineral salts. These inorganic salts are stored in the, in the matrix in between. And so when you look at compact bone, you see these circles or these units called osteons, and there's a, a big canal inside where there's blood vessels and a nerve. And then these little black regions right here are the osteocytes. And so in between is what we were been just talking about. In other words, that's where the mineral salts are and the protein. So here's the osteon canal right in here. Here's an osteon, sometimes called a Halvergian canal. Here's the periosteum out here. So inside, this is kind of interesting, that the osteons are connected to one another through, through uh, transverse canals as well. So there's lots of blood uh, flowing through, uh, through the compact bone as well as inside the spongy as well. That's kind of interesting. And the cells are, are in these little uh, crevices called lacuna or, or space. And then again, uh, this is a uh, electron micrograph showing the dark region is where the blood vessels and the nerves are, and each little dark spot are blood bone cells, and then everywhere you don't see a black spot is the extracellular matrix. And so, great shot of the tra transverse canals that connect the osteons together. Here's the compact bone, which is on, on the perimeter, and then the spongy is on the inside right here in the diaphysis. So let's talk a little bit about development. I don't know if you knew this, maybe you did, that we all started off as, as a fetus. We started off as an embryo and then a fetus. And as it turns out, we started off with, with a lot of connective tissue, like principally cartilage. And then that cartilage gets replaced by bone. And so bones form by replacing connective tissue in the fetus. And so there's actually two kinds of ways in which this occurs. The skull forms through intermembranous bone formation, which is fibrous connective tissue forming layers upon each other and then bone replacing it. And then there's out outright replacement of hyaline cartilage, which is called endochondrial bone formation. And so this is all everywhere you see in red is collagen. I'm, I'm sorry, is uh, cartilage, which does have a lot of collagen protein in it. So this intermembranous bones is, is really just found in the skull, and the, the, the bone is rather flat, and it develops from layers and layers of connective tissue. This uh, endochondrial bone is the majority of our bones, and so you start off with a, like a, what looks like a bone, but it's really cartilage. And then you can see here is the 
the beginning of the periosteum. And so what happens is this cartilage then needs to be replaced by bone. And so here's again a, a, a reminder of what this cartilage looks like. This is, these are the chondrocytes right here. And so what happens is that there's a primary origin inside the diaphysis of where primary ossification, so this is what we're talking about is the ossification of cartilage into true bone. And this occurs during fetal development. And it occurs in two places. It occurs first in the center of the bone. So that's called the primary location of ossification. And so it starts off here and the bone is forming. Over here is at the ends are still cartilage. And then more bone is starts to form. And the cells that are sort of winning in terms of this dynamic balance are the osteoblasts, the ones that are producing uh, and laying down the bone tissue. Then there's the osteoclast that tears down the bone, but the osteoblasts are winning during fetal development. And then once the inside of the bone is becoming mostly bone tissue, uh, the secondary locations start to occur. So there's secondary sites of ossification that appear in the epiphysis area right in here. And so you can see this is early on and this is a little bit later. What's curious is that there remains into adolescence this one little plate, it's called the epiphyseal growth plate. So this cartilage remains up until young adult age. And there'll, there'll come a point where you stop growing when there's no epiphyseal uh, plate at all and it becomes total bone. But what I'm getting at, and I want to emphasize this, just to back off some of the detail, is that the bone grows like this. So it grows from the ends. And so the length of the bone it, it expands, but it's growing from the ends outward like this as the epiphyseal growth plate is replaced by true bone. And so bones increase in length. So one of the things that is of, of interest is that when you're a young adult, you really don't want a fracture in your epiphyseal growth plate because that might influence the growth of a particular bone. If that happens in a femur, for example, that could be rather serious because one bone in, uh, may be growing a little bit longer than the other if there's damage to this epiphyseal growth plate in one, one leg and versus the other. So this, is, this growth plate is responsible for the lengthening of bones. So that's, that's kind of neat. Here is an actual micrograph of the epiphyseal growth plate. So here's the point of cartilage and then the new bones are being put down right here. And so here I like this diagram because it shows the whole formation from when we were a fetus to as we're a fully grown adult and the bones are not growing longer anymore. I'm not saying that the bones don't, aren't still exchanging calcium, but they're not. And if there's a fracture to the bone, the bones can repair, but they're just not growing in length. So I think most people know this, that once you reach your adult height, that's it. But you can continue to grow in adolescence because you have the epiphyseal growth plate, as you can see right here. And so this is kind of interesting. You can see the primary location and then the secondary centers of ossification here. And so this whole homeostasis, which means maintaining status, it's like a bank. If you're running low, then you'll draw some money out of the bank. If you have an abundance, like you just received your paycheck, you'd put money into the bank. So the idea is keep eating your calcium, keep exercising, and you're going to be strengthening bone. But it's, it's dynamic. So there's these two kinds of cells, osteoclasts, that are the ones that are tearing it down, increasing calcium in the, in the blood. And then there's osteoblasts that are building bone, in other words, lowering blood calcium. So if you're a female and you're pregnant and you're, um, you're trying to develop your fetal, uh, your new baby's skeletal system, you would be, your osteoclasts would be tearing down your bone so that it would increase your blood calcium, which would go into the fetus as well. So it's, it's kind of costly to your own bone. And so let me show you a little something about that. I, this is a short animation that's kind of interesting showing this. So this is like inside the bone right here. And you know this whole notion of osteoclast and blast, these cells right here are the osteoclasts right here. You can, you can see because these are the cells that are eating the 
uh, the calcium matrix, and these are the osteoblasts that are actually putting it down. So it's a, it's a combination of making bone, tearing down bone. And so the ones that are like this one that's eating, the osteoclast, it's, it's, it's a weird looking cell, it's multinucleated. So that's interesting. And how does it do it? It actually secretes acid, and that acid will start to uh, erode the mineral salts, as it turns out, which will then leave just the protein collagen, and then those salts go into the bloodstream. And so if you need calcium in your blood, these osteoclasts can take care of it. Whereas if you're drinking milk or eating calcium in general, cheese, these osteoblasts will be increasing. So if you have a, a, a fracture and your bone is broken, the osteoblasts will be putting down this uh, bed of calcium and also adding mineral salts. So that's kind of kind of cool. And so what I want to say about that, just in conclusion, is that the bone in general is a great place to store salts. And so there's a lot of calcium and phosphate uh, that, are, that are stored in the bone tissue and that are released from osteoclasts. And so what's interesting is this calcium uh, exchange is under the influence of hormones. And there will be more discussion of hormones coming later in, in, in separate videos, but I just want to mention some important calcium hormones. So when you drink calcium, and there's a lot of calcium in your, in your bloodstream, a hormone called calcitonin, which is produced by the thyroid gland, is, is released, and that helps to lower blood calcium levels. And you're like, well, where's the calcium going? It's being stored in the bone to make the bone strong. Whereas there's another hormone called parathyroid hormone that is released that reduces uh, the density of calcium in the bone and increases blood calcium levels. So that's kind of interesting. So the bone's a storage for calcium salts and, and phosphorus salts, but here's, a, here's something that's kind of negative about this. Since it's good at storing minerals, it can also st store unwanted minerals and elements such as lead. So if you're exposed to lead somewhere in your, in your life, sometimes you, you can't get rid of it because your bone stores it and so high levels of lead are, 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 are toxic so hope you enjoyed this video on the skeletal system there's a lot going on in the skeletal system and so I have to hold myself back a little bit to make it a little bit uh, reasonable and so um, hope you learned a little bit about the skeletal system and some of the great functions of the skeletal system thanks for watching